God, on this very cold, cold day, we thank you we can gather in the warmth of your spirit's presence and power to be sustained in your word and meal. And now use this time in the hearing of your word and by your spirit's power that we may apply it in our lives of fruitful living. In Jesus' name, amen. I began today by holding up this Uno card. Do you know the card game Uno? Yeah. And it's a specific card. <coughs> it's the reverse card, as we see on the screen as well. So obviously, when you, you play the reverse card in the game, the direction of play reverses. <coughs> and it goes in the opposite direction. I thought of this Uno reverse card today because today's God story includes the Beatitudes, the nine blesseds, the Beatitudes that stand at the very beginning now of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount in Matthew is chapters 5 through 7, and start with these awesome Beatitudes. And their significance in the entire gospel is just huge. I mean, one commentator said, they're like bolts of lightning just separating the skies because they really set the tone for the gospel and for the Sermon on the Mount as to what God is up to and what the kingdom of heaven is all about. They're all about the reign, the rule of God. And I hold up the reverse card because in them, in these Beatitudes, we hear this surprising reversal of how we typically think. And they challenge us. They challenge the way we typically look at the world and perhaps our own lives. You know, it's been said that every Christian community is bound to be tested by the Beatitudes tested. Why? Because they challenge our conventional thinking and wisdom. They challenge the way we typically think about success and power and status. Who's in? Who's out? Who's blessed by God? And the Beatitudes usher us into this whole new way of looking at the world and God's kingdom. Why is that? Well, if we just back up a little bit to the end of chapter 4. You know, as I said, the Beatitudes start chapter 5. But at the end of chapter 4 in Matthew, we hear that Jesus' fame is growing and the crowds are coming out to him. And it, chapter 4 ends, they brought to him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he cured them. The great crowds include members of society who many in society might say, well, they're cursed. No, cursed with illness or disease or pain. But Jesus doesn't see it that way. And he launches as he starts now kind of upending the value structure of society as he launches in to these nine beatitudes, nine blesseds, blessed. The word in Greek there is makarios. And it could also be interpreted, interpreted as God's favor, divine favor upon these, God's favor, blessed upon who? Well, we hear God's favor, makarios, God's favor are these upon poor in spirit. Those spiritually empty, doesn't say full. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn, the meek. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The merciful, the pure in heart. God's favor, blessed makarios upon the peacemakers. Blessed God's favor upon those who are persecuted. For righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you all 
when people revile you and persecute you on my account. Do you hear a reversal? A surprising reversal. I don't know about you, but as I hear this list, they sound more like the have-nots in society than the haves. Those on the bottom rung, not the top. What the Beatitudes so clearly set forth is that startling reversal of human ways of valuing. And, and in them, there is this, this edge, there's this, this bite of being countercultural. Now, there's some forms of religion that suggest that, well, the, all the goods and honor and status of this world, that they're the signs of God's favor. If you don't have, the world says, well, what did you do to deserve it? Or if sickness or tragedy or sorrow comes upon you or your family, there will be voices that may say, well, you must have done something wrong to deserve this. But Jesus sees it differently. Jesus announces in these Beatitudes, blessed are those who are broken in spirit. Those who are on their last leg know their only resource is God. Blessed. God's favor on them. Or that second Beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. Those who have loved and lost, who truly know that heartache of emptiness of the soul. Or those who grieve over the brokenness uh, of this world so out of joint with sin and, and, and violence and hatred. Blessed are they, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are, who are meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. Blessed are those who long for righteousness, for they will be filled. In, in these Beatitudes, there is this pull to the future. They will be comforted. They will be filled. And it is a pull of God's hope, God's promise, that changes the present reality in God's hope, in God's promise on us. Blessed, God's favor. Now the Beatitudes reverse our thinking. They turn the world's value structure on end. The world often calls the blessed ones those who are at the top of the game. Those who can swim with the sharks, the winners, the self-sufficient. Just think of how it's glamorized in society, the self-made man or the self-made woman, idolized. But we are dependent on God. When did you last see a job description saying, now hiring someone who is meek? <laughs> now hiring someone who is merciful. You know, it almost sounds a little silly. No, we're more used to words of, you know, aggressive and strong and, and able to stay ahead of the pack. But as followers of Jesus, called to be light, called to be salt, in this world we are called to a peculiar way of life. When the world screams revenge, get even, get back. God calls us to show mercy. When the world shouts, hang on to that grudge, nurse it. God calls us to forgive as we have first been forgiven. When the world says we need to find our worth in money or possessions or health or wealth, status, titles, God says here is our worth, making the sign of the cross on our foreheads from our baptismal waters in God's promise and God's purpose over our lives. God reverses the value structures of society and this one who declares this, Jesus, God incarnate, not only talks a good talk, but he walks the walk. He walks the way of the cross. The cross, the epitome 
of humility and shame and weakness. All that the greatest reversal can take place. The greatest. So that we need not climb up to heaven but that God comes down, God stoops down in Jesus at the cross. God meets us in all our suffering, in all of our sin, in all of our sorrow. The cross says that God finds us and meets us there to restore, to renew, to bless us, to save us. So that right here, right now, you all are, we all are blessed by God for the sake of Jesus Christ to live that blessedness. Not to hide it, but to live it. Let your light so shine as we are sent as light and salt in this world. Now, last Wednesday, <clears throat> here at ninth grade YDT, we had an amazing example of being that light and salt and blessing in the world. It was just a special night. And now I just have to back up a little bit to, to, to let you in on the background because on the first Wednesday in January, when everybody came back for YDT, Nicole Grant, who's the coordinator for ninth grade YDT, asked Kelly Orndorff to come and give her story, tell her story. And as many of you know, um, Kelly, soon after graduating from UMD, uh, discovered that she had an aggressive brain tumor, as big as a fist. June 4th, 2015, Kelly, with her parents, Paul and Jane Orndorff, were in the ER in St. Cloud Hospital and received that night this just gut punch, that punch in the gut news. Kelly, you've got a brain tumor. Well, in that, the doctor gave that word. In the room was the ER nurse that night as well, listening and watching all of this. And then the ER nurse's name was Beth. And then Beth had to wheel Kelly up to the room uh, on the floor, the neural floor of the hospital. And she wheeled her up to her room and had to get back down to the ER. But she said, can I give you a hug before I leave? Yes. And then as she gave that hug to Kelly, she whispered some words in Kelly's ears. And these were the words, lean back on your faith, God's got this. Lean back on your faith, God's got this. And that ER nurse, Nurse Beth, left back to the ER didn't see each other again. Well, Kelly, and you've heard her speak often, well, she always starts with those words of Nurse Beth, because she said even that night, it, it changed her. She could, she could just feel that she could draw on God's strength. A and it's been such words of encouragement in these past years. And so she shared that in her story to the ninth graders on that first Wednesday of January. And she finished, and then the ninth graders all went to their small groups. Well, Mindy Schultz, one of our, prime, our youth and family primary directors, is also a small group leader for a group of ninth grade boys. And they went and, and were processing this, and they were so impacted by Kelly's story. And as they started talking, they said, well, wouldn't it be neat if, if somehow we could reunite Nurse Beth and Kelly? Do you think, Mindy, do you think we could ever try and find Nurse Beth? And he said, well, I'll, we'll try. Now, Mindy, due to her great sleuthing skills, and that's a whole long story in itself, but long and short of it, they're able to locate Nurse Beth, who's still an ER nurse at the St. Cloud Hospital. Mindy called her and, and asked, she asked her, would you come and have this reunion with Kelly? Yes, she would. So last Wednesday night, everybody was in on it but Kelly. Paul and Jane, Kelly's parents were here, uh, several of the small group guides. Kelly had to be um, uh, to, uh, asked to come out of a, a meeting. She didn't know what was going on, came back to the commons. And I've got a one minute video, and I've asked Kelly if I could show it. One minute video, and we'll hear, and you'll have to listen closely, because the volume, just, we can't get it up hardly any louder. But Mindy is saying how much of an impact that 
story with Nurse Beth was. And then we're going, and, and all the time, Beth is just sitting a couple feet from Kelly. Let's watch. So Kelly's words, I did exactly what you told me to do, to lean on my faith. God's got me. It was just such a blessing upon blessing, upon blessing. And that these ninth grade boys so thought how, what a blessing to, to, to bring Nurse Beth and Kelly together again. To be that light and salt, that's who we are. That's all you all are. We are a community gathered around the cross, around the one, Jesus Christ, who died on a tool of execution reserved for the lowest of the low so that we might have life, so that we may be set to see this world and our lives as God sees, and then sent to be light and salt and blessing in this world. Go, for you see, this living word declares to you today for the sake of Jesus Christ, all your sins are forgiven, and you are blessed by the living God, now and forever to be light, to be seasoning in this world. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and